People have no clue what it's like to love somebody and watch this happen. This woman with Lou Gehrig's disease and many others thought they'd have access to medical marijuana, but state lawmakers are dragging their feet and could throw up new roadblocks. It's the blind leading the blind up there. We'll also investigate more problems at the Department of Veterans Affairs that could cost billions. It seems that nothing's really gotten better. And with Trump's team under FBI investigation, Marco Rubio may regret saying this. Can this country afford to have a president under investigation by the FBI? Who can be in the Think of the trauma that would do to this country. Plus, in our humor Russian segment, we'll put Campbell. James Comey back on the hot government. seat. Closing question, will you then tell us what you really think of President Donald Trump? No, I'll never, I'll never tell you. This is Lenny Power and Politics. Now we'll start with federal inspectors who turned up more trouble at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Among other things, the VA is having problems with its suicide hotline. While the suicide rate has surged to around 22 veterans a day, who take their own lives. My son was uh, one of these uh, 22 a day from back in 2013, Staff Sergeant Joshua Berry. Uh, miss him terribly. Howard Berry helped plant these 660 flags in a Cincinnati field. His flag represents a veteran who committed suicide just in the past month. These men and women, you know, they volunteered to defend our freedom and they've been left behind. And no soldier left behind, I think, at these flags represent an awful lot of folks at work. And as Barry and other veterans raise awareness, federal inspectors are raising more concerns about how the VA responds to veterans in crisis. This report from the Office of Inspector General just slammed the VA's suicide crisis hotline. Inspectors say it's been understaffed, poorly managed, and it's put some veterans on hold until they hang up. We have to act now to ensure that our veterans have timely access to the care that they need. Well, VA Secretary David Shulkin has promised change across the board, and some of it will not come cheap. I can pull up x-rays, I can pull up reports, and it's just a click away. For example, this government training video shows how the VA's computer medical system called VISTA coordinates patient records. But Shulkin plans to scrap the system because of security and maintenance concerns. And by one estimate, the cost to replace it could run up to $16 billion. We will protect those who protect us. And that's just starting, because I think the veterans have not been treated fairly. And on that point, a couple of whistleblowers have in fact reached out to us, and the VA tried to fire one of them for eating a stale sandwich. after scandal rocked the VA. My employment records were illegally altered. Whistleblowers said they still got punished for speaking out. Approximately 20% of the ER nurses would retaliate against me. The saying, shoot the messenger, is probably alive and well in the VA system. And the Office of Special Counsel continued to investigate claims of mismanagement and harassment against the veterans who reported. We usually hear their accounts through statements on Capitol Hill or from whistleblowers who won't show their faces on TV. It seems that nothing's really gotten better. But this vet wants us to show his face, even though he says he's still facing retaliation at work. I emailed Troy Thompson more than a year ago, and he just recently replied to say, he's ready to talk. You probably can find numerous people that have been just uh, blackballed and run over and, and just kicked out of, the, out of the ranks unjustifiably. Thompson joined the Navy as a young man. Cooking was his specialty, and he served thousands of meals along the way, from ships to VA centers. He worked his way up to food service production chief in Philadelphia. And in 2012, he noticed sanitation problems, including insects and rodents in the kitchen. We had areas that weren't being cleaned. Investigators say his complaints were never investigated. But the day he reported them to his bosses, Troy Thompson was transferred from the kitchen to the morgue. I'm a food service uh, production chief, and they sent me to a lab area to um, process body parts and um, clean up urine and blood vials and um, dump uh, biohazard materials. And after months of scrubbing the morgue, the VA found a reason to fire him for something he had done in the kitchen. After about 
um, several months, um, she brought me back down and issued me a proposed removal for eating those sandwiches. That's right. They said he violated policy by eating a couple of sandwiches that were stale. The sandwiches were expired uh, just, just within a couple days. So it's not like they were uh, moldy or things like that. The sandwiches were worth a total of $5 before they expired. But by eating them, the VA nailed him for disregarding food labels and stealing government property in the form of stale sandwiches. The VA moved to fine him and fire him until he reported this to the Office of Special Counsel. I can tell you, it takes a lot of courage to come forward. Special Counsel Carolyn Lerner said Thompson's case fits a pattern at the VA, where whistleblowers who disclose wrongdoing often face trumped up charges while the misconduct they expose goes unpunished. Agencies or organizations can uh, just act like a rogue faction and do just whatever they want, no matter what their own rules say. They will circumvent their own rules even. After the Office of Special Counsel kicked in, the VA scrapped the plan to fire Thompson and transferred him back to the kitchen and agreed to pay him damages. You might expect the story to end there, but Troy Thompson reached out to me to say they're retaliating and punishing him yet again, and he'll share the details when they resolve his complaint. It's very, it's uh, you know pick and choose. You know if you're if you're with me, then I, I cover for you and it gets swept under the rug. If you're not with me, then you have to deal with their vengeance and their unfairness and their uh, disparate treatment. And vets have also told us they have not received the help that they need because of Congress. For the past couple of years, for example, we've shown you how lawmakers denied in vitro fertilization benefits for wounded vets. But Marissa Lynn shows us how Congress took action after our investigations. It's just absolutely unbelievable to see them together when I'm looking at them and he is he is what I was we were working mm -hmm. for. I mean, he is every everything that oh, we yeah. hope far for. exceeded what my expectations. Alex and Holly Dillman's seventh month old son, Maximus, is the light of their life. It's just a, it's a miracle how it all comes together. Yeah. But two years ago, they didn't know if this day would ever come. You know, it's really heartbreaking because um, it is really hard to not know if we're going to be parents. A retired Army Staff Sergeant, Dillman suffered life-changing injuries while deployed in Afghanistan six years ago. After injury, you're not really in a place to bring, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult. Until recently, the Department of Veterans Affairs didn't cover the cost for combat wounded veterans for in vitro fertilization. Last year, former President Obama signed a bill that allows the VA to pay the costs. However, it will have to be revisited every two years for now. I mean, these are services that make these men and women whole again. The Dillmans went through three rounds of IVF before having their baby boy. I don't know what's after this now. I mean, this yeah. is really an American dream. Now they want to see a permanent solution so other families like them can also live out the American dream. It shouldn't be any different for the men and women, you know, who serve our country. Um, who have risked life and limb, they need to know they're going to be able to have access to this treatment. Yeah. Maximus keeps the Dillmans busy these days. His life is the most precious gift of their lives after the amount of suffering and struggling they went through to have him here today. This is what it's about. Seeing the, just the, the smile on your face and yeah. the sparkle in his eyes. I mean, seeing him talk about Maximus this way, this is what, this is what it's all about. <laughs> So Marissa, this is a temporary fix. What exactly do we mean by temporary? So the law right now allows for the VA to pay for IVF and adoption fees for the next two years. Just the next two years. So right. what happens next? What, what would it take to t go from temporary then to permanent? Obviously another act of Congress. Now they do want to make this a permanent situation, but they're just not there yet. Okay, Marissa, thanks a lot. Coming up, FBI Director James Comey, of course, took the stand this week. And in our humor segment, we'll show you how it could have played out if we asked the questions. Well, President Trump is taking a lot of heat, of course, for some of his tweets. This week, for example, the FBI director shot down Trump's claim that former President Obama wiretapped Trump's phone. So. We wondered here what Comey may say about some of Trump's other more interesting tweets. So we decided to take Comey out of context with real tweets from President Trump. This hearing will come to order. Mr. Comey, do you cringe when you read the president's tweets? I do. 
And since you revealed the Trump campaign has been under FBI investigation since last July, does it strike you as ironic that his spokeswoman once tweeted? And I quote, imagine if a Republican presidential candidate came under FBI investigation as votes were being cast or his press secretary once tweeted, probably tough to get excited about someone under FBI investigation or his former campaign manager once tweeted, most honest people I know are not under FBI investigation. It's not something I can comment on. Admiral Rogers, what about the president's tweet in which he wrote, quote, I have never seen a thin person drinking a Diet Coke. I apologize, I don't truly understand the question. Wait a minute, there's more to that quote. Okay, what more does my distinguished colleague from Florida wish to enter into the record? This follow-up tweet with a picture of Trump drinking a Diet Coke. Mr. Comey, could any other president do that with a straight face? No president could. Now that Senator Rand Paul could be the swing vote on Trump's health care plan, do you agree with Trump's tweet? Truly weird Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky reminds me of a spoiled brat without a properly functioning brain. I'm worried we're going to a place I don't want to go, which is commenting on any particular person. And so I, I don't think I should comment. Wait a minute, I just noticed that guy in the middle there keeps mimicking my expressions with a pencil. Guy with a pencil making fun of me, make that pencil disappear right now. Thank you. He's doing it again. Stop that. He's doing it again. Well, what about Trump's classic tweet? The Electoral College is a disaster for democracy. Didn't he become president by winning the Electoral College while losing by millions of votes across the nation? I know that is extremely frustrating to some folks, but it is the way it has to be. And what about this classic tweet? An extremely credible source has called my office and told me that Barack Obama's birth certificate is a fraud. All I can say is what I said before, that we don't have any information that supports those tweets. I'd like to jump in with Trump's claim of superior intelligence. Quote, sorry losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest and you all know it. I've said the FBI and the Department of Justice have no information to support those tweets. Closing question, will you then tell us what you really think of President Donald Trump? No, I'll never, I'll never tell you. With that, I guess we're adjourned. Okay, then, there you have it. Coming up, we found voter fraud here in Tampa Bay, and now state lawmakers have another plan to stop it. They also have some plans that could throw up new roadblocks for medical marijuana here in Florida. We found some people who vote, then illegally vote again, sometimes vote again here in Tampa Bay and all across the state of Florida. And now the Florida legislature has yet another plan to crack down on voter fraud. We uncovered voter fraud in Florida more than two years ago. And I support my people in North Carolina, I support my people here. That's my colleague Mike Sinan asking a voter in the Orlando area why public records from 2012 show that he voted in Florida and North Carolina. Because I live both in places. Uh -huh. I live in North Carolina, I pay taxes in North Carolina, I do the same thing here. He seemed to not know that was a problem. Well, I didn't know that. And he's not alone. I found six others in Hillsborough County, seven in Pinellas County, who, according to public records, voted in Florida and North Carolina in 2012. And researchers with the Voter Integrity Project found more across the state. We are just a private group, a private citizens doing this with public data. And we were able to find 149 that we could stake our reputation on, turn them over to the authorities and say, you might want to investigate this. In a state with around 12 million voters, 149 is a drop in the bucket. But remember, that's only checking Florida and North Carolina. That 149 could go up with each of the other 48 states. And our state once decided a presidential election by 537 votes. The first thing Florida needs to do is get back in the interstate cross-check program. That's a no-brainer. 20 other states share their voting records to flag people who appear to vote from state to state. But Florida has not. However, that could finally change this year after years of pressure from election managers. A state house panel approved a plan to share our election data with states across the nation to catch people who vote, then vote again. Okay, we're joined now by Adam Goodman, Republican strategist. President Trump made claims of widespread voter fraud. We certainly have found no evidence of that, but it does happen, and the legislature is trying to do something about it. It does, and, and Florida finally is joining the other states to try to get to the bottom of it, as we remember. 
Uh, we had a presidential campaign decided by fewer than 540 votes. And the idea of every vote counts certainly came home, was driven home uh, to the country through Florida that year. And, you know, I have uh, in the past worked uh, with Katherine Harris. I was uh, right in the middle of that cauldron. I can tell you the one thing we were trying to do was make sure that Americans would come out of the election, regardless of their choice for president, with confidence in the system. And there's nothing greater that we can fight for than that. The president's week got off to a very rough start with Comey's testimony confirming the FBI investigation, one, two, saying he sees nothing to the wiretapping claims. How damaging was that in terms of reputation and credibility to the president? Depends who you ask. Uh, I'm asking some, you. <laughs> some say that's Trump being Trump. What does Adam Goodman uh, say? Uh, I, I think what is happening is you had the master disruptor, the president who is out to disrupt the system and make things work again, who is distracting from the disruption with things like this. I think he has to stop tweeting. I think he has to tweet less and start uh, pushing more for the very things that will define whether or not he will go down as one of the more successful presidents in the history of this country. Adam, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, Florida voters approved the medical marijuana amendment overwhelmingly last year, but the legislature has not figured out how to make it happen yet. And they have a couple of bills that could undermine the medical marijuana industry all across the state. So Marissa Lynn shows us why and what it means. They get their peace of mind. For those living with debilitating diseases like Kathy Jordan, November 8th, 2016 is a date that won't soon be forgotten. Battling with ALS, Kathy and her husband Robert have been some of Florida's strongest advocates for medical marijuana. The war is over. That's, that's you know, I'm, I'm a veteran, but I mean, the war is over because now we have a constitutional amendment. That's a very powerful thing. Amendment 2 was approved by 71% of Florida voters, meaning patients like Kathy who suffer from numerous conditions can use medical marijuana as treatment for their ailments. It says we have a constitutional right for cannabis as medicine, if a doctor recommends it. Two years ago, Manatee County agents raided the Jordan's home and took her medicine, marijuana. People have no clue what it's like to love somebody and watch this happen. Kathy has now lived with the disease for more than 30 years. When she was diagnosed in 1986, doctors only gave her a few more years to live. As a matter of fact, they call her a unicorn. She's a myth. Marijuana, they say, has extended her life despite what doctors initially told her. Because if I didn't smoke, I wouldn't die. This is that simple. Amendment 2 went into effect January 3rd. Still, the state legislature has much to figure out, including how to enact it. A handful of bills have been filed that, if passed, could make the amendment almost useless to those that need it. A House and Senate bill would ban people from smoking marijuana, and the House bill would ban edible marijuana and the use of vaporizers. It's the blind leading the blind up there, and, and uh, it's just, they're just making medical decisions they're no way qualified to make. So now the Jordans will continue commuting from their Manatee County home to Tallahassee to make sure their voices are heard. We're going to keep on fighting them. We just, I don't know how to stop fighting anymore. So state lawmakers were supposed to implement the medical marijuana amendment. They've not yet done it. So how much more time, Marissa, do they have? So the state has six months from January to figure out rules to enact the law and then how to regulate medical marijuana. So we've got just about three months to go heading into June. OK, so you met with Kathy Jordan estimates. How many other medical marijuana patients are we talking about here in a state of some 19 million people? Hundreds of thousands. We're talking about 500,000 patients who look to medical marijuana for treatment. And you've been going through the numbers. What are the polls showing you in terms of where voters stand on what the legislature is doing or not doing? So 44% of voters say that the state is moving too slow to enact all of these rules. 30% uh, say the state is just about right with their timing of it and nine percent say it's moving too quickly with the law pretty lopsided saying they're not going fast enough okay marissa thank you much mm -hmm. now coming up evan axelbank will join us to score nelson versus scott governor rick scott may challenge senator bill nelson of course next year and we'll show you who may have the advantage Okay, we're here now with Evan Axelbank. We're talking about the race for U.S. Senate, presuming that it's Governor Scott versus Bill Nelson, the incumbent. How's it looking? Well, right now, the polls are very interesting because on the one hand, you have Bill Nelson, who has been known to Florida voters for a long time. 
and he seems to be leading by five or six points or so in some of the polls. So that's very interesting. But what's what I think is even more interesting is that more people have a negative opinion of Rick Scott. Um, only 28% of people had a negative opinion of Bill Nelson in this most recent poll, but 40% have a negative opinion of Rick Scott. So that means that the views of the chief executive of the state are more enshrined, they're more baked in, and so that's something Scott's gonna have to deal with as he continues to explore this run. There's bad news for Bill Nelson, though. If he's only slightly leading Rick Scott at this point, well, Democrats historically lose the turnout battle big time in off-year elections. You lose the turnout battle with those numbers, you lose that race. And there's no doubt about it. One of the things that Nelson's going to have to deal with is his numbers are not quite near 50 percent. The poll that had him against Scott was about 44 percent for him and 28 percent for Scott. So he's not quite near that magical 50 percent number that pollsters look for for really strong support. So that's one big thing. And then the second thing is that Nelson's not really in a position to do much right now in the United States Senate because the Republicans own both chambers of, of, of Congress, both houses of Congress, and that means that he's not in a majority position. That means that there's not a lot that his interest, that not a lot that he can do to advance his interests, to bring money back to the state, and to pass meaningful legislation. Evan, thanks for your time and for your insight. And that's our show, folks. We will see you again next week.